In the mid-1990s, a proposal was made to merge two of the world's most distinguished airlines, the flag carrier of the UK, British Airways, and one of the leading firms of the United States, American Airlines. The marriage of what were essentially the national carriers of their respective countries led to a major stir in the global aviation market, with legal action and corporate disputes ultimately seeing this scheme not come to pass. The potential for two carriers of such influence as British Airways and American Airlines to merge is owed to the deregulation of the respective airline markets for each nation. The British aviation industry had been strongly stacked in favour of British Airways' nationalised predecessors, the British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC, and British European Airways, or BEA, the former being Britain's international carrier serving the colonies of the British Empire, while BEA plied its trade on domestic routes within Britain and Europe. The essential monopoly held by BOAC and BEA gained severe scrutiny from other prospective startup carriers, such as Danair, Laker Airways and British Caledonian, which gradually saw the power of these two monoliths eroded throughout the 1960s, culminating in their merger to form British Airways in 1974 and the eventual privatisation of the firm in 1986 under the government of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. In the United States, regulation of the airline industry had begun in 1938 under the Civil Aeronautics Board, or CAB, which was devised by Congress as a means of protecting the fledgling industry from excessive competition, while also maintaining a certain level of rivalry to promote efficiency. The CAB oversaw airline fares, determined route structures, and regulated several other key industry features, creating a system that was noted for its exceptional protectionism, but refused to allow major carriers to fail, while at the same time stifling new startups through excessive legal costs and petty bureaucracy. The airline industry remained under this system for 40 years, when in 1978, the Carter administration sought to diminish entry barriers for new airlines and encouraged price competition among rival carriers, culminating in the Airline Deregulation Act, which disbanded the CAB. Authority to review airline mergers and alliances was subsequently given to the Department of Transport, or DOT, later handed to the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division from January 1, 1989. With deregulation on both sides of the Atlantic, airline consolidation skyrocketed, with the 1980s seeing the overall industry witness unprecedented growth that included 51 airline mergers and acquisitions between 1978 and 1988, examples including Frontier and People Express joining Continental, Western merging into Delta, Northwest taking over Hughes Air West and Republic, TWA acquiring Ozark, and US Air acquiring Piedmont. Contrarily, however, deregulation brought significant financial hardship for airlines and service problems for consumers, air corridors to smaller communities declining severely, with 260 cities in the United States losing their air service in the first year after deregulation, and 40% of the nation's airports losing service within two years of the act being passed. In 1980, with deregulation having been in effect for only two years, the airline industry suffered record losses of $280 million, which subsequently rose to $900 million by 1982, despite the additional 7 million passengers it had acquired since 1981. Despite this negative financial climate, many airlines consummated mergers during the decade following deregulation, though for many this only served to compound their problems, as carriers were often burdened with the outstanding debt of the weaker airlines they had integrated. This became more crushing when economic stagnation occurred, such as the recessions of the mid-1980s and the 1991 global economic recession, while other issues emerged through the integration of airline practices, training regimens, and more notably union contracts that led to severe strike action as carriers were forced together into unhappy corporate marriages. Regardless, airline mergers continued to be an effective strategy for carriers up until the start of the aforementioned 1991 global economic recession caused by the first Gulf War, where due to the burning of oil fields by the retreating armies of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, a spike in fuel prices sent the cost of living skyrocketing and encouraged fewer passengers to fly. In the wake of this catastrophic loss of demand, many of America's most famous airlines, including Continental, Pan Am, America West, Midway, and several smaller firms, filed for bankruptcy within months of this crucial event, with Pan Am, Midway, and Eastern Airlines ultimately liquidating their assets. However, in the face of such corporate prudence, amidst unfavourable economic conditions, 
The airline industry settled into a period of relative stability as the surviving firms sought to simply maintain their operations without making waves across the wider market. The main airline events of the early 1990s were the continued battle between larger established carriers and low cost, low fare startup firms, with mergers generally taking place at low level between companies that had little influence over the market, such as 1997's Value Jet Airways merger and the Western Pacific Frontier merger. This stability was briefly rumbled, though, in 1995, when US Air initiated talks with United Airlines and American Airlines as to a possible combination of their assets, though these talks eventually broke down due to US Air's high labor costs. Nevertheless, the possibility of a US Air alliance was enough to rekindle the airline industry's attention on consolidation, and major carriers prepared themselves for the next announcement of two large companies forming a merger. Come 1996, the airlines generated record profits while also enjoying strong stock prices, though despite this, growth prospects for these firms were few as the industry had reached maturity, meaning the prospect of consolidation was once again considered on the cards as a natural progression within the marketplace. As such, airlines sought to improve their growth by adding more hubs to their networks and increasing international alliances, though this only came with the benefit of seeing their domestic growth increase by a mere 3% per annum. Other non-economic reasons for the potential of reviving airline consolidation being that the negative experiences that many airlines endured during the 1980s would have given an insight as to what to avoid when proposing a merger between two carriers. This mindset, therefore, set the stage for what would become one of the most high-profile consolidation proposals of the airline industry, the merging of British Airways and American Airlines into a single entity. Announced on June 11, 1996, former rivals American Airlines and British Airways made public their plans for a proposed alliance between the two giants of the world's most powerful economies, the alliance, as originally proposed, involving both airlines pooling costs and revenues, planning strategies such as route structuring and fares, feeding passengers to each other, and possibly swapping equity stakes of up to 20%. American Airlines stated that the original alliance proposal had three main elements coordination of all passenger and cargo services that the two carriers operate between the United States and Europe, with profit sharing on alliance services, code sharing across each other's global networks wherever possible, and the establishment of a fully reciprocal worldwide frequent flyer program. The impetus for such an alliance was recognized as the need for both carriers to stay competitive in an increasingly global market, as had been exhibited with the creation of global airline alliances such as Star Alliance, One World and the Qualifier Groups, that had amalgamated many aspects of various flag carriers. Perhaps because of the widespread consequences involved with the alliance, regulatory considerations by both the United States and British governments worked to halt the completion of the merger, while resistance by rival airlines, arguing potential antitrust violations and other factors, served to further complicate matters at a legal level. One of the major hurdles facing the BAAA alliance was the passage of an Open Skies Pact between the United States and Great Britain, with the American government declaring that it would not approve the alliance unless Britain agreed to an Open Skies Pact, an agreement the United States had with up to a dozen countries at the time, as well as liberalized air transportation pacts with nearly 30 other international partners. The Open Skies Treaty would provide British and American air carriers unrestricted access to airport hubs, to which both airlines had stated their accord with such a policy advocating that their proposed alliance promoted open competition and lower ticket prices. Closely tied to the issue of an Open Skies Agreement was the argument raised by rival airlines that the American Airlines-British Airways alliance would stifle competition from other carriers, with American Airlines and British Airways, at the time of the merger announcement, carrying around 60% of the airline traffic between the United States and Great Britain. Thus, the alliance, if approved, would mean the pre-existing competition between the airlines would be eliminated, and thereby create, as declared by rival operators such as Virgin Atlantic and Continental Airlines, a massive transatlantic prize-gouging cartel, suggesting that the two largest transatlantic carriers should not be allowed to combine their operations without requiring a substantial divestiture of assets to assure genuine competition. However, the CEOs of both British Airways and American Airlines, Bob Ayling and Donald Carty, dismissed such claims that the alliance would hamper competition or fix prices, Carty being of the opinion that the merger would still be open to undercutting in terms of price, 
worthless, meaning that the combined AA-BA alliance could not sustain 60% of the market indefinitely, while Ailing declared that the alliance would increase competition and lower fares. More crucial, though, was the access of the carriers to the coveted takeoff and landing slots at London's Heathrow Airport, the UK aviation authorities, at the time of the proposed merger, only allowing two US carriers to fly into Heathrow, American Airlines and United Airlines. The strangling of access for other American carriers was a contentious topic between the British and US governments, with the latter insisting that Heathrow open its doors to more American companies, including Delta, Continental, Northwest, Transworld Airlines and US Airways, before allowing a merger deal between British Airways and American Airlines to be ratified. The need to satisfy the British and American governments was coupled to an additional requirement to meet the approval of the European Union, with the EU long stating it would block the alliance if the airlines did not make concessions on slots at Heathrow, informing American Airlines and British Airways in July of 1997 that they would have to make room for other airlines by giving up 350 slots at Heathrow. While both American Airlines and British Airways continued to assure their rivals that slots could be made available at Heathrow for other carriers, this provided little comfort to those across the industry, while the American Senate hotly debated the topic of the proposed alliance, allowing airlines such as Continental and TWA the opportunity to voice their concerns. The three primary arguments made against the merger were that it would be too large, it would dominate the Anglo-American air travel market, with increased prices resultant, and even in the event of an open skies agreement being reached between the British and American governments, genuine competition would be impossible because of the slot and facility constraints at London's Heathrow Airport. American Airlines responded to each of the concerns by declaring that the American Airlines-British Airways alliance would actually be smaller than the then two pre-existing corporate alliances of Star Alliance, as formed through the combination of Lufthansa, United Airlines and SAS, and the KLM Northwest Alliance expecting that the grip of the two carriers of 61% of the market would likely fall to 41% under open skies. They also considered the matter of capacity at Heathrow Airport to be non-existent, and determined the facility not to be full, drawing emphasis to the fact that 45 new airlines had been able to secure slots at Heathrow between 1991 and 1997, and that 71 daily peak hour slots had been added at Heathrow in the four-year period between 1992 and 1996. In addition to the matter of antitrust laws, open skies agreements, and the capacity of Heathrow Airport, many other ancillary factors also plagued the viability of the British Airways-American Airlines merger, with some carriers, including Delta and United Airlines, deliberately dragging their feet when it came to providing information as to their operations to the European Union, so as to intentionally draw out the proceedings and stall for time. At the same time, US Airways brought a lawsuit against the proposed American Airlines-British Airways alliance, claiming that the merger would breach a 1993 investment agreement that British Airways had made with US Airways, in which the UK flag carrier had purchased a 24% stake in the American firm, stating that American Airlines was interfering with this investment contract and the alliance would violate antitrust laws. Eventually, a federal judge dismissed the interference allegation against American Airlines on a technicality, but reserved judgment on the antitrust claims, the US Airways lawsuit being one of a plethora of legal challenges brought against the alliance that continued to draw out the proposed merger and generally slow down proceedings. Eventually, the merger was called off quietly during 1997 due to a lack of agreement by the regulatory bodies overseeing the alliance of the two carriers together with various strict conditions being implemented on the finalised deal that would have been severely damaging to both British Airways and American Airlines' place on the market should the combination of their assets have gone ahead. The most notable of these would have been the requirement to surrender a large number of slots at London Heathrow to other carriers, which would have robbed the enlarged company of an important competitive edge when seeking to dominate the lucrative transatlantic market. British Airways suffered heavily from the collapse of the proposed merger deal, as not only did it lose the company a potentially dominant position on the wider market alongside American Airlines, but also saw the collapse of its $500 million stake in US Airways that had barely been paid off, signifying a substantial loss for the firm. This was combined with the severely negative reception of the recently unveiled Project Utopia tailfin scheme by CEO Bob Ayling, which heavily damaged the image of Britain's flag airline and saw much of its once loyal customer base opt to use rival carriers such as Virgin Atlantic. 
However, in a theoretical scenario regarding the successful merger of British Airways and American Airlines, industry analysts had considered what the impacts of this alliance would have brought to the wider commercial aviation market in terms of revenues, passenger impacts, employee influence, and the general state of the combined carrier going into the new millennium. Most analysts considered that, based on the sheer size and magnitude of merging the assets of British Airways and American Airlines, which would subsequently dominate 25% of the global airline market, the collaboration of these two marks would not encourage further consolidation between airlines, but instead see regulatory bodies work to deter similar alliances in the future along the same lines as what was proposed by British Airways and American Airlines. This would have left a binary situation of the respective governments of both nations to either approve all merger proposals out of fair competition or refuse them so as not to see the airline industry descend into a muddled arrangement of gigantic international super airlines with highly complex overseas arrangements with their respective governments. From a purely economic standpoint, even with the successful merger of British Airways and American Airlines, analysts predicted that the remaining airlines could stay competitive provided that they undertook their own mergers, as mooted in response to the combination of the British and American carriers should they occupy 61% of the transatlantic market. Examples of this included United Airlines, Southwest Airlines and Alaska Airlines, combining to dominate 28% of the market, Delta and Northwest Airlines combining to acquire 29% of the market, or US Airways, TWA and America West combining to take on 15% of the market, smaller or weaker carriers such as TWA being rooted out of the wider market and thus resulting in a generally stronger playing field of established brands that would consolidate the industry. However, all of these would be dependent on the ability of each carrier to align their business practices, corporate policies and trade union agreements, often the death knell to many a combined airline in the long term as demonstrated in the 1980s. Further benefits could also have been achieved through the demands of the regulatory bodies on both sides of the Atlantic, which demanded that under no circumstances would the British Airways and American Airlines merger go ahead without the sacrificing of vital landing slots at London Heathrow, a benefit to all other rivals, whether standalone or merged into various corporate alliances. Ultimately, the merger of various carriers would occur in the decades following the start of the new millennium, with a spate of consolidation occurring primarily in the United States, as legacy airlines came together in new corporate alliances, the first being the acquisition of Transworld Airlines by American Airlines in 2001 after the former's slow fiscal collapse throughout the previous two decades. 2008 would see Delta acquire Northwest Airlines and America West acquire US Airways, who itself was acquired by American Airlines in 2015, or United Airlines would take over Continental Airlines during 2012 leaving essentially three major players in the field of legacy airlines within the American market that now vie for power over low-cost rivals such as JetBlue, Southwest Airlines, Sun Country, and Alaska Airlines. Meanwhile, in Europe, a general pattern of forming airline alliances rather than whole-scale mergers remains the order of the day, with British Airways combining its assets with Iberia in April 2010 under the holding banner of the International Airlines Group, while KLM merged with Air France to form the KLM Air France Group, and Lufthansa took a controlling share in Swiss International following the rocky revival of Switzerland's flag carrier in the wake of Swiss Air's collapse during 2001. In conclusion, the potential merger of British Airways and American Airlines, in practical terms, was one essentially doomed from the start, as despite the consolidation of these two firms' assets into a large transatlantic operator, far too many legal and political restrictions existed that precluded the ability of these carriers to form an international alliance of the scale proposed in 1996. Had the merger successfully reached fruition, the subsequent fallout would have stripped far too much from each airline's existing facets to make the proposition one mutually beneficial to either party. In the end, though, while a merger of this design did not occur on an international level, internal American collaborations in the 2000s and 2010s, as well as pan-European alliances under holding companies and airline groups, led ultimately to the consolidation predicted by analysts should the British Airways American Airlines merger have gone ahead in the mid-1990s. This, therefore, has created an industry that has worked to root out the weaker brands and thereby streamline operations with a range of fewer but stronger marks that now dominate the modern commercial aviation scene.